out in my shed again playing with the Coventry Climax. I'm still waiting for the petrol pump kit to come. Uh, somebody pointed out in the comments quite rightly that I don't actually need the petrol pump if I just mount the tank higher. Gravity will be enough to fill up the float bowl in the carburetor. Um, I've proved that by just running it on the pipe, the fuel in the pipe. But the kits are available and in order to have the engine as complete as possible I'd like to repair it and get it going. Uh, the petrol tank has been sitting in a vap rust for quite a while. It's actually probably ready for me to paint it. Um, you can see that's taken all of the rust out of it. Uh, there's a little bit on the bracket I'll need to wire brush because I don't have a container deep enough. I can get most of it. Um, so I'm going to repaint this. I will um, red coat it, same as I did on the Riley petrol tank. I have got some almost olive drabby type paint. It's probably not quite right, but uh, that was the closest I could get because what I want to do now, oh, the other thing I will do is I did manage to straighten this shaft, but there's still a little bit of run out in it, which I'm not happy with. Uh, this was the original shaft that came in the engine, and then I machined up this piece to extend it. What I'm actually going to do is remake this entire piece. Uh, this has got a like a half dog drive in the end. I'll machine this up out of one piece of steel that fits on the distributor and has the drive dog I'll machine another piece which is like a sleeve that goes on the outside and that will give me this tube on the outside and the eccentric for the, um, the fuel pump so I'll machine this up as a separate piece and then probably make it a really tight push fit onto there and Loctite it in place I think that'll be enough there isn't a lot of force on this um, so I need to undo this, get that off, and then I've got a piece of steel um, that I can machine that from. And the other thing I want to do is I'm going to take this off this horrible frame that it's on. I wanted to know how much it weighed. So I've got it set up here in my little gantry crane. Um, these are actually um, tie downs they're not really lifting straps so I probably shouldn't really be doing this but I've got two of them on there and I only need to lift it up just enough I've done it once already to weigh it um, I lifted it up then zeroed it and then set it back down so it's a um, 125 kgs and my little piwaka waka friends back um, which is good uh, I think I can't remember how much the wheels I got for it are. I think they're 70 kg each. And I'll have four of those. And I think you kind of rate the, when you build a trolley, if you've got four wheels, you kind of rate it for the weight of three of them, effectively. That seems to be what they do. So that'll be, those wheels will be easily big enough. Uh, they're little casters, they're cast iron casters. They look a bit more period. So I will build a timber frame that this this piece will bolt onto and the casters will sit on that so that's going to lower it down quite a bit um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to unbolt this and I'm not sure I think I can unbolt here hopefully there's those go into something captive they're not just yeah I must do uh, so if I undo this undo this and undo that same on the other side and the controls I should be able to lift the engine and the radiator off this frame which then lets me um, undo what's been done to this I'll have to remove the exhaust as well um, I can actually do that up here so what I'll do is I'll undo all these bolts lift the engine off move this out put the engine back down on the ground um, just so it's not hanging from the straps and then clean this up and it's got the holes in the corners so that can be bolted down to the timber frame I'm gonna to have to grind all of this off uh, that's why I got that paint but I don't think it's gonna be close enough to the color uh, it might be if I just touch it up I just want to touch it up where I grind it so there's no bare metal I might actually have a green primer that's a closer fit so that's what I'm doing now 
I have the stand out of the way and with the engine back on the ground it's sitting up on some blocks I didn't want to rest it on the sump uh, you can see it's it weighs 111 kg um, there's no tension on those anymore so I do need to take the radiator off I did get a fan belt for it um, I think it's an A28 I kind of measured it up and got what I thought was the closest belt there's a little bit of adjustment there but of course to get it on you have to get it over the fan there's not enough room between the radiator and the fan at the moment to sort of squeeze it in so it's going to be easier to take the radiator off which just looks like it two bolts at the bottom and the hose clamp um, pull the radiator off I might re-solder this pipe while I've got it apart and um, get the fan belt on it and so this stand I'll take the oil gauge off um, this is all original as far as I can tell because it's got captive nuts for everything so all I'm going to do is remove all the added bits so I need to take this off this has all been added um, these metal wheels strip it back down to this frame which I'll do now since it's it's not not raining it's been raining quite a bit but not too much today so I'll do that before the rain comes back I think took everything outside and I cut that monstrosity off uh, of course it started raining as soon as I went out there and I just chopped the tubes off and then I worked at removing the tubes from the frame I sort of had to cut through the welds and I figured this is a good chance to test my new parts washer because uh, this is filthy and it's full of grease on the inside uh, I guess I'll give this a go see how well it works and then I'll be able to much more easily clean this up I want to uh, get it clean before I start grinding it just to get it back to a semi sensible looking state uh, I'm not sure what's happened in this corner if this is original or not or if somebody's modified this it's a bit hard to tell um, maybe that mounting was different on the actual generator setup because it looks looks like it's part of it uh, it doesn't look like someone else has cut this off because there's still paint there so all I'm going to need to do is clean up where this was welded tubes were welded um, and that should be fine I don't want to get all the paint off it I want to leave it looking old I just want it clean so I'm going to give this thing a try but I'm, I'm not going to film it but that it's that exciting seeing someone wash parts a little bit more on the engine uh, I can't remember what I mentioned before I did solder this back up and just put a bit of black paint on it um, that holds that pipe in place I have painted the frame I didn't have the right color paint so I ended up just painting it with lots of different colored paints just to make it look a bit old and splattered and dirty um, like it's been sitting around for a long time which it probably has so covered in overspray I'll wipe it down with a dirty rag oily rag later uh, same with the petrol tank I painted it that brown color because that was the only one I've got but that's that kill rust paint so that's fuel proof so any spills won't affect the paint and again I just gave it a bit of black overspray so it didn't look new or it didn't look restored um, that'll come all dirty as well uh, and I've been spent the rest of the afternoon machining up a new drive shaft for the distributor which is this here so this is a single piece um, I machined the whole shaft from a single piece and I milled that sort of half dog flat on the end you might be able to see it in there um, and then this is the original collar I took that off the old shaft I knocked out the pin and I made it so it was a press fit onto here and I've also used red Loctite I didn't want to have to drill through and pin it um, I, th I thought it was cracking before but now I've got the pin out yeah there is still a little tiny crack in there 
so I didn't want to risk drilling through and pinning it again. Um, I had to use the press to get it on. It's quite a tight fit and that red Loctite will never come off uh, unless you heat it. And then this piece here is just a little piece of metal tubing um, that again I machined the end to be like a tight press fit. That's held on with, I used blue Loctite on that one because that doesn't need to be quite so secure. Uh, that can't actually go anywhere anyway, even if it came loose. Uh, I keep losing my little torch. There it is. Because if we... You might not be able to see, but if you look down in there... Oh, I don't think the camera will focus close enough. But down in there, there's a gear with the little drive dog sticking off the top. So even if this tube came loose, it's effectively um, captured between the other half of the drive dog and the gear. It'll sit on top of the gear and this shaft. So I just had to measure everything carefully, make sure that eccentric for the, oil, uh, for the fuel pump was in the right place. And then this now drops down. The other thing I did is made it so the distributor body sits right down against the block much closer. Um, there should be a point where, there we go. If you turn it, it engages, it drops down. So that should now turn with the engine. Uh, you can see I've got the fan belt in place as well. That was quite tricky. Um, I didn't have to take the hoses off the radiator, except for the top hose. I was able to leave the side one with these bottom bolts undone, I was able to move the radiator like that to get the fan belt in. The hardest part was actually getting the fan belt between the pulley and the frame. Uh, I had to sort of squeeze it down in there. This fan belt is a, an A28. Um, it really needs to be probably half an inch longer because it's this is on an eccentric cam. So there's little holes in here and you can put a, a little bar in there to rotate this to tighten the belt. It's in its loosest position and it's, it might be just a little too tight. Um, but those, that A series of belts, the, the 28, 29, 30, I think they go up in inch increments, which might be too much. So I'm going to see how I go with this one. Uh, there is, there is flex there, so that, I think that'll be all right. And I just made sure the radiator isn't anywhere near the fan. Um, and I gave it a bit of a wipe down with the oily rag while I was in there. So hopefully now that distributor runs true, doesn't have a wobble on it. Um, I was very careful how I machined it to make sure I kept it as concentric as possible. So I had... Um, steady at the end and um, just just went very carefully and tried to put it back in the same position on the lathe every time I only had to turn it around once um, so I think that should be fine so with the petrol tank done um, I need to figure out where I'm going to mount the the oil pressure gauge I'll have a an ignition switch and Possibly a rev counter. I could use that little electronic one. I've got some old um, old car ones. Maybe I could use one of those. Um, they're actually reasonably cheap, the little electronic ones. I could probably get one from China for almost nothing. So I might do that. It doesn't matter if it's not very good. It doesn't have to do much. Uh, so the next thing to do, which will be tomorrow now, is I'm going to make frame out of this timber I got. Uh, I got this stuff, it's kind of rough sawn, but I'll be able to plane it and what I'll do is I'll do lap joints in the corners to make just a rectangular frame that this will then bolt down onto. Um, and I'm going to look at where I can put the casters. The casters will either go in the corners or I'm thinking once I've got the frame assembled out of this stuff, um, if you imagine this one's going this way, maybe I could put a plate on here and put the caster inset a little bit, which will lower the height. I don't know if I really need to. Um, I think 
can't remember off the top of my head what height those casters are when they're fitted. Uh, about that high, four inches, I think. So if that's where the frame would go, it would be an inch higher because of the steel. It would lift it up. Um, from this position, it would be about another six inches. So it would be up about here. So that's not too high. Uh, I'll see when the casters arrive. Hopefully this week, early this week. Um, don't know how secure this is. I'm tempted to try starting it just to check the distributor, but I think I'll wait until it's all mounted on the um, on the right stands rather than sitting on blocks of wood. But that's good progress. I can't tell just by hand cranking it if the uh, distributor is running true, but I'm pretty sure it should be true now. I use the the new parts washer to clean that um, frame from the engine and it worked really well. So the solution I've gotten here is just the simple green parts washer fluid. Um, and yeah, it seems to do the trick. It doesn't smell too bad. There's a lot of gunk in there. Um, you just need the brush to agitate it. What I didn't realize when I bought this particular washer, it was on sale, uh, was that there's another brush that has a hose that attaches to here, but it doesn't come with it. You have to buy it separately, which is kind of annoying. Uh, so I need to do that. I just need to think what else I need to order because I'll have to pay for the shipping, of course. But um, no, it cleaned up that, that little frame really well. Um, like I say, I'll give that a bit of a rub down with a a bit of old oil, probably the old oil from the engine actually, and uh, that should be fine. Uh, I guess this is a Riley update. Um, I've been doing lots of other things because I've been waiting for my the pinched nerve in my neck to get better because the next job on the Riley is making the body panels and as soon as I start doing that, I'm going to be doing all sorts of things that will basically aggravate that injury, including sort of wheeling and uh, hammering. So I just want to make sure I'm not going to do any more damage. Um, so I'm waiting until that's completely healed up. Basically, you wait till it stops hurting. So the Riley, uh, where are we at? Fuel system's done. Pretty much everything's done except the body panels now uh, and then interior trim. I am going to figure out all the nuts and bolts I need to order. I'm going to do another order to the UK. I could use metric ones for the ones that hold the body down but I just can't bring myself to do it so I'll replace all those 8mm bolts with uh, 5 sixteenths which are what all holes are drilled to anyway. And there'll be bolts for those. I shortened the headlamp things, I think I mentioned that last time. I'm going to assemble the headlamps and see how well they work with the reflectors I've got, but there is a place up in Auckland I can send the reflectors for resilvering. Uh, it's probably going to be needed, we'll see. If I can get the car to the point where it's warrantable without doing that, then that's what I'll do. I'll get it through and then I'll worry about that later. I'm very unlikely to be driving it at night, I would think, at least to start off with. So in preparation for that, I've been cleaning up a bit, just trying to tidy things up. I've got my parts washer now. Uh, I've been cleaning up my English wheel. One thing I did is drilled, um, I put it on these casters, which are lockable, which is good. And I always had it just off one of these offset holes. So I drilled a hole in the middle just to make it a bit more stable. I've given it a good clean because it was filthy. And one of the things that's always annoyed me about this machine is when the little cradle part that holds the lower anvil is in place. That goes in there. Uh, there's always been slop in it and there's two places where the slop comes in. One is in here. So I machined up a, a new bolt with a shoulder on it to run in the slot. That one is there so you can change the angle. Um, 
you could lock that down. The problem is, if you lock that down, this no longer moves up and down, and you need that to move up and down to adjust your, your tension, so you don't lock this. So that's taken away some of the slop in there. And the other place that there is slop is... Um, in this sort of eccentric cam thing. So this goes in there, I always put the handle on the other side. Um, you can sort of turn it around so I have the handle there, it's out of the way. Uh, this is what lifts this up and down to let you get the panel in and out. So you, um, you can see it's on an eccentric with a flat on it. So you, you lift that up and that locks this into place. The problem with that is there's kind of slop in there and there's a lot of slop in there as well, which means this can move. I don't know if that actually matters, but it doesn't seem right to me. So what I have done, some of the mess, is I machined up a little sleeve and that fits on there and that takes up the the slot in this at the moment it's a very tight fit um, once it's all greased up that should be a lot lot freer so what i need to do is push this into here so it can go up and down and then that'll slide inside there this won't fit through those holes um, so ideally what i would do is make the sleeve big enough to go all the way through i guess but this will take up some of the slop, so it's going to make it better. And um, I don't, like I say, I don't know if it makes much difference because the wheel will kind of, it'll track where it needs to go anyway. But uh, it just annoys me. It just annoyed me that it felt so wobbly. So I'm going to see if that makes a difference. Um, like I say, it, it, the, it worked perfectly fine before. There's a, there's a panel there that I was testing on. I've got another one over here somewhere. There's plenty of shape in that. Um, I have in the past sort of polished these wheels up. The better finish you have on the wheels, the better finish you get on the metal. But because I'm going to paint it, it doesn't really matter anyway because it's all going to have to be um, sort of scuffed up to paint. So I'm not trying to get a mirrored aluminium finish on the body. It's going to be painted. So I'm not too worried about that surface finish, as long as there's not tons of holes or dents or anything in it, which there isn't. So I'm going to reassemble this now with some grease and uh, see if that helps. With this all reassembled, um, that's definitely helped. There's still movement there, but when you're actually wheeling a panel, that doesn't really seem to matter. It kind of goes away, but it does feel more solid now. Um, that was just a little test piece I did, just a scrap, and that's the kind of finish I get straight off that wheel. Um, when I got this wheel, it actually had a little ding in it, which is there. Um, so I was worried that was going to leave huge marks all over the panels, but it doesn't. It, it leaves a little trace, you can see it. But then, honestly, a, a quick scuff over with a red scotch, and that removes it. Um, you actually see more where you stop rolling you can sort of see the tracks where where the roller has stopped and then you've started again um, see a few marks on the bottom again it's easily good enough for what i need to do and you know you can i'm using 1.6 mil aluminium so i'm going to weld it and then you have to grind the welds anyway um, so i think this will be fine the other thing I always have to do on my wheel is sometimes I have to shim these uh, and I just use little pieces of beer can and that's just to make sure the wheels touch properly. Maybe use a little bit more shimming. Um, before I actually got the wheel, I didn't know about this, I just got this wheel because this happened to be the right sort of one and it was on sale, but there's a whole there's two different theories around whether or not the wheels, the anvils, should have a continuous radius or a flat. And I don't actually know which is better or not. That's one of those things where you'll get one person 
swearing that one is better than the other and somebody will say the complete opposite. Like I say, I don't really care because, you know, in, in just a few minutes I was able to to sort of wheel that much shape into just a little panel. So it's going to do what I need. Interestingly on the Riley, it doesn't need a huge amount of shape. Um, a lot of this is almost, it's not flat, it's curved obviously, but there's not too much compound curve in it. There'll be a little bit on the door, uh, most of it will be in the tail, probably in here where it all gets, the radiuses all get pretty tight. But, uh, that, uh, that was a practice door skin I did, I think before I'd actually done the timber frame. I think I was just trying to match that shape, that gives you some idea of the sort of curve in it. And uh, this one I overdid, so that ended up too curved. I'm going to use that piece of panel. When the time comes, I'm going to practice my aluminium gas welding on that. So I am going to gas weld it. Um, I think that's going to be the best way. It leaves the welds annealed. Um, you use the same material that you're welding as your filler rod. You cut strips off it, use that as your filler, so it's all the same material. Um, it's a little trickier than TIG, I think, but like I, I've mentioned before, I did it on the Austin 7 and that was fine. So I should be able to do it again. I just need to practice. And so it'll all be gas welded. Um, 1.6 aluminium. Be wrapped around the timber frame. I don't have to worry about painting the inside of it. It'll be a lot lighter than steel. And I don't think it'll break because my frame is a little bit chunkier than they normally would be so it's going to be pretty rigid um, and if it breaks you just rivet rivet it back together or you you fix it it's an old car it's going to break so that's the plan um, like I say I'm just waiting till my neck gets better I might start doing my welding practice because that's fairly gentle that's a, a fairly easy activity um, just to see if I can remember exactly how you do it Just for fun, I wheeled that panel flat again, mostly flat. Uh, trying to get something that you've already curved back to flat is actually really quite tricky. Um, apparently there's an exercise you can do with a square like I, I showed before, where you put shape into it and then you flip it over and you take the shape out. And if you measure the panel before and after, it will be bigger afterwards because it's been stretched. But because I was just doing this roughly, I wasn't really being even in my pattern, which means when I tried to flatten it out again, it's gone a bit, it's gone a bit wavy. There's a bit of oil canning in it too, I think. But, um, it's reasonably flat. So, yeah, the machine seems to be working fine now. Um, it's interesting how much flex there is in it, even, even steel like this. Uh, people go to great lengths to make the machines more rigid and I don't know if it just means you'd get shape faster because like I say this one works uh, it brings up the metal but if it was more rigid would it work better and would I notice because I'm not a professional of this I just, I'm just an amateur so the machine is probably easily up to my skill levels it'd be really interesting to know um, you know what 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 real advantages there are to the the different sorts of machines and the different sorts of wheels for someone who actually knows what they're doing and even then I suspect what happens is when someone's a professional they get a nice machine and they just get used to that machine so then I always wonder well would they get the same results if they spent the same amount of time on a completely different sort of machine and I suspect they would because they're professionals and they know what they're doing they've got a feel for things um, so it's a bit like lathes. Any wheeling machine is going to be better than no wheeling machine. So I'm happy I've got this. Uh, the other thing is when you're, when you're taking the shape out of it, you do get more tram marks because the top anvil is flat and your curve is going that way. So of course the edges are going to dig in a little bit. So you kind of have to start off fairly gently. But even then, I mean, this is straight off the machine. It's filthy because my hands are filthy. But that panel's fine. Um, you know, once you've 
sanded that back a bit, ready for paint, you're not going to notice any wheeling marks or anything in it. But just around the rigidity, you can see the machine flex, this machine anyway, when you, when you push the panel in. Probably can't really see it. But when I pull it out, you'll see this will drop down, and that's because of the flex in this arm. Let's see if you can notice. Um, it's really quite a bit. And again, that's going to be causing interesting issues because this is effectively a lever. So when you put the panel in and this moves up, it means the wheels will go out of being uh, parallel to each other. Again, don't know if that causes problems or not. There's all sorts of interesting little things with these machines. I do wonder what would happen if, if I was to drill a hole straight through the frame here, all the way through, down through here, and put a, um, a threaded rod there, which will, which will help keep it under tension, in which case it means the bending would be just over a shorter length. Would I notice any difference? Would it, would it make any difference to the machine? Might be something worth trying one day, but uh, probably not today. You'll be able to see the spring back. Um, and you need that because if you, if you open this up so the panel slips in easily, it literally slips. So you can see the spring there. It has to lift up on this machine because it's just not not very rigid. So, interesting, but if I can put shape into a panel, a little panel like that, and then take it out again, I'm pretty sure the machine's working fine. Hmm, it's getting a bit messy again. I need to clean up and vacuum. There's bits of wood and stuff everywhere. But started making the timber frame that the engine base will sit on uh, just just glue that I'm clamping it up but I've noticed it's it's not sitting quite right it doesn't seem quite right uh, something's gone a little bit funny I think it's not sitting flat but the idea is that this will then sit on top of here will be bolted on there and there'll be casters. I do need to run a couple of saw cuts because that bit of the frame is deeper. So I just need a slot that that will sit in. And this frame is the same size as the steel frame and the casters will bolt to the bottom of that. So I've clamped it together with these long clamps that my a friend of mine gave me. They were missing the little bits that go at the end so I just knocked up a couple of temporary ones out of out of wood um, really quickly temporary ones that's why that one's gone a bit wonky I think but that'll do just to clamp all of this together while the glue's drying and I think what I'll do is I'll put a flat board over the top and put a ton of weight on it and that'll that'll hold it all in place once the casters arrive they're gonna get screwed into here so they'll screw through those two pieces of timber and join them all together or I'll bolt them through or something uh, so that's coming along pretty well. I'm pretty sure when it's sitting on the frame the flywheel clears, otherwise I might need to notch the back there. But I'm sure that when it's sitting on this frame, that frame can sit flat on something and everything everything clears. It's even the bottom of the exhaust, I think, sits level with that. Since I've been messing around with the distributor drive, of course I need to reset the ignition timing. Uh, this time I'm using my little lamp. Oh, what's happening? Oh, bulb's kind of unscrewed. So just a little bulb holder and a 12 volt bulb. And you just put that across the points and that gives you a really easy way to tell when it's opening. So you can see I've got it set to 5 degrees again. Much easier with the bulb and say a multimeter. Uh, there's a little bit of backlash in the system, but because the engine always ever turns that direction, 
when you set the points, you need to make sure you're moving in the right direction. So you can see that comes on there, but if you go back because of the backlash, um, you'd get the wrong reading. So make sure you're always going the direction you need to go. Um, that should be set up now because the position of this has changed. I need to refigure out which one is number one, but I should be able to hook the, put the plugs back on, and I think it'd be safe to try firing it up here. It's pretty solid. It's supported at the back and at the front. Um, so I think it'll be fine to actually try starting it again. Put the plug wires back on in the right order, hopefully. Firing order for this is 1342, which is the same as the MG and the same as the Austin 7. Uh, the Riley is different. Uh, it's 1243, so it's kind of backwards. But um, I realized I can't try starting it because the, the run stop controls are loose. So I can't set the, the right choke and throttle position. So there's no point trying to start it now. Um, I did remember to put the oil pressure gauge back on though. Otherwise I would have had oil squirting out all over the place. Uh, so yeah, I'll have to leave it until it's back on its frame. I have that timber frame sitting over there with some weight on it till the glue dries. I'll leave that till tomorrow now. Uh, the reason it there was a gap there is because I wasn't as careful as I should have been when I was doing the half lap joints, and uh, they're a little bit a little bit mismatched. But nothing I can't fix with a with a plane just to get it flat. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, I'm just going for simple. And what I'll do is I will actually treat that timber with some of my Metal X timber treatment stuff, since I've got lots of that left over, uh, and that'll stain it all green. So it'll, it'll match the army color scheme, scheme I guess. Um, but yeah, until it's back on that steel frame, I can't try starting it. I did, I was careful, I made sure I got all the straps and things out of the way, because now I've got the fan there, I don't want anything getting caught up in it and spinning around. Uh, I think that's about it on this now for the weekend. Uh, I'm going to have a bit of a clean up because everything's getting messy again. There was still some old Riley parts on that shelf that I moved out to the shed. Uh, so I can put a few other things up there. But I think it'll just be a, a fairly quiet afternoon. One last quick little job for the weekend. Uh, being autumn, we're seeing more mice trying to get inside. So we have mice living in our ceiling. I've tried to block all the places they come in, but it's just almost impossible to stop them. So I have a lot of mouse traps up there. And just recently, now the season's changing, I've been getting three, four mice uh, a week. So I've got a bunch of these traps up in the ceiling. I tend to use this style, the wooden ones, but unfortunately they're not very good these days. They don't seem to last very long. They're cheaply made. Um, I've actually lost one up in the ceiling, so I don't know if the mouse stole it or got trapped by one and ran off, but um, I've one of them's gone missing, which is interesting. We've also had a rat, which um, head gardener saw inside the house eating from the dog's bowl, and uh, it, it got a fright and sort of sauntered off. Apparently it didn't run. And then a little while later, we heard rush, rustling inside our kitchen bench unit. And it had got inside there. It had come up where the, the piping gets into the uh, back of the dishwasher and, and into the sink. And um, it was rummaging around in the rubbish bin. So I opened the door and only just saw it escaping. So I went and got a rat trap and put that under there and within five ten minutes he'd come back and we actually got him so pretty sure the rats are gone now but i still want traps up in the ceiling for the mice so i've had a few of these so-called better mouse traps but the problem i find with these is 
there's no way to actually tie the bait onto it. And the reason that's important is because I use coconut meat as the bait on the traps. Um, I just find coconut works way better. Uh, might be because I'm half Sri Lankan, who knows. But in New Zealand, people always say to you, use peanut butter, use peanut butter, or Nutella, or something like that. And you're meant to smear it on the, on the little bait thing. But that's just messy, and you have to keep cleaning the bait and adding new bait. Um, I find with the coconut meat, it's nice and hard, it's very solid, so you can jam it onto these, these little traps, these metal ones, and it won't go anywhere. Um, they can't really steal it if you attach it properly. And the good thing is, it'll last forever. Uh, even when it dries up, it just kind of desiccates the coconut, and they'll still eat it. So the good thing is you, you catch a mouse, you reset the trap, you don't have to fiddle with the bait. Whereas if you're using peanut butter or Nutella, it goes all sticky and gooey and horrible. Um, you have to clean them and add more all the time. A single coconut, I think one of these has lasted me a couple of years already. Um, I think I've got another one in the cupboard. I should actually crack that open and see what the meat's like inside that. It might not be any good anymore, but uh, that works really well. So these supposedly better mouse traps, I had to take apart and improve by drilling a few holes in them so I could put that wire there. So what I can do now is wire on little pieces of coconut bait. Um, so even though someone can come up with a better mouse trap, somebody else can come along and make it better still. But uh, I'm gonna take those inside now and set them up in the ceiling, see if we get any more mice.